John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello once again, John. Hi, Todd. Well, good to have you again. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have Greg here, but that's okay because we're going to talk again about an accident where fortunately you have some inside knowledge about it that you can shed some extra light on top of what the accident report had. Uh, we're talking about an accident with a Cargo DC-9 uh, by Evergreen Airways in March 18, 1989, crashed in Saginaw, Texas, just outside of Fort Worth. And this was an event where shortly after takeoff, the cargo door on the rear part of the, uh, uh, of the fuselage opened up. And when they were returning for a landing for, at the departure airport, the door completely went over on the top of the fuselage. There was all sorts of aerodynamic issues with the aircraft and the crew lost control and they crashed. Both crew members were killed and no one else on the ground was injured. And this is a, an interesting one because you actually worked for Evergreen before this event, and you had quite a bit of knowledge about their operations and the issues with cargo doors on DC-9s. And you can give us insights as to uh, how this compares to other events that involve cargo doors on large airliners. And so you've heard about this, obviously, after you worked with the airline. And when you heard about this crash, what was going through your head about this operation? Well, when I first heard, because, you know, I've been a crash junkie like you forever. But when I first heard about Evergreen crash, and that piqued my interest considerably because I worked for them for quite a while. And then when I, I found out that it was a DC-9 that crashed, because they operated DC-8s and 747s, so it wasn't clear uh, with the initial reports just what it was. But then as the information started to come out, uh, they uh, somewhere along the line, I saw that it was the aircraft 931, which is one of the airplanes that I had worked on extensively. So I was, I was really piqued with that. But then as time went on and some of the information uh, about the airplane came out, uh, this airplane was not the same 931. So Evergreen had apparently uh, disposed of the 931 that I worked on, and that was a rather special airplane, and uh, replaced it with this one. And it may not have been an instant replacement. They may have saved the, the uh, end number for future use, which they sometimes did. But in any event, uh, uh, this was a DC-9 cargo airplane that had a lot of work on it. And you got to think, you got to remember that back in this period of time, after FedEx had shown the world that this overnight delivery uh, was was a, a very economically viable company. And all of a sudden, everybody was jumping into the business to haul freight. Uh, Emory Air Freight was big in the business. UPS had come into the business. Uh, DHL had jumped in. Uh, so th this was a very competitive market, not only for the freight business, but it was very competitive for the airplane business because they were searching for airplanes that were either freighters or could be converted to freighters. And of course, prior to this, these airplanes were built, the DC-9s were built in the 60s and 70s before the freight business took off. So there, there were some that were factory made, 
uh, cargo or convertible airplanes. And I, this was one of them actually. Uh, well, it was a convertible airplane. I don't know if it was factory made, but there was a big rush to get these done. And uh, not all the cargo doors were created equal. And, you know, I can tell you from experience on working on these airplanes that, you, you know, I mentioned that we had those early DC-9s that were converted and uh, uh, the cargo doors were not the same. So if they got converted in Israel, they had a different door than if they got converted uh, elsewhere. So there was a place up in Oregon that converted them. I forget now, but there was a number of places around the world that were converting passenger airplanes into cargo for the package delivery people. So it was it was boom time for those people doing those conversions. So it was it was uh, it was interesting time and interesting latching mechanisms on the doors. Uh, some better than others, and uh, I think that's exactly what happened here. You know, this airplane took off out of Texas. It was on military charter. It was doing multiple stops to get back to Hill Air Force Base in Utah. I think there was four stops involved. It was carrying some interesting cargo, including on the crashed airplane. It was it had a bunch of explosives on the airplane. So it was uh, it was traveling around. Now, the airplane left one of the stops. I think it may have been the second stop. I didn't count them. Uh, on takeoff and the the captain the the crew was in the cockpit. And the first officer went back and on these airplanes, they usually pull the stairs up and close the cargo door, which he did. The lights went out and he went back in the cockpit. On takeoff, they had an initial, when they pressurized the airplane, 10, sec 10 seconds, I think it is after you, uh, the nose wheel comes off the ground, the pressurization starts up on the DC-9. And as soon as it started to build some pressure, the, the door popped open. So they had a door warning light and they initiated a return to airport. And as they were turning, the door came all the way open. And that's sitting up there like a great big billboard. And the aerodynamics of the airplane was severely affected. Uh, forget the door now is above the fuselage. And what's to the rear of that? The tail and the control surfaces for the airplane. So you disrupted the airflow back there. Now it makes controlling the airplane um, immensely more difficult. And he struggled with, with getting the airplane turned around back to the airport and it, it just, uh, time ran out. They report and I, in on the, the actions of the first officer because they were saying that in one of the findings that the first officer didn't properly close the door. And the indicators on the door were such where, uh, and again, you could explain this better than I could, there could be an indication that seems that, to say that the door is locked and closed, but in fact, it isn't. And how does that work on this airplane? All right, so this switches on the latches. If you think of it, the latches are like a hook. And when you close the door after you get it down, these latches have to turn and go over. Well, depending how the switches are, are positioned, adjusted, sometimes you can get the light to go out before the, before the hook is all the way over. And maybe that's what happened here. They never determined it exactly. Uh, but uh, I had common problems with that as a mechanic uh, with airplanes with door problems. So it depends how the latches were set. But the way the NTSB was able to determine the problem, they went to another airplane with the same door design and timed how long it took to close the door from open. And since the voice recorder was recovered in, in good enough shape uh, to extract the, the noises, they determined that he, he terminated the closing process too early. It didn't have enough time to fully latch. So that's how they determined that the, the door wasn't properly latched and it was the first officer's spot. And he mentions on the, on the voice recorder that he pulled the door, that there was a threshold door sill protect the piece of metal that went down to keep the, the cargo loading people from damaging the the, uh, the doorway of the airplane. Mm -hmm. So he mentioned on the record that he pulled off that out of the way before he closed the door, which is normal. So he had the right sequence. He was just in too much of a hurry 
to wait to make sure that the door was fully latched. And consequently, it came unlatched when the pressurization was put on. Not the first time that that has happened in airplanes. We have a number of other examples. Uh, uh, United Airlines out of Hawaii, uh, a number of other ones around, many of which didn't result in a, in a uh, crash. Many, many resulted in a return to the, to the airport, and that would only be a mechanical interruption report, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't really bubble up to the surface where everybody could get a look at it and, and you know, hear about it and maybe sharpen their skills a little bit about closing their doors, which is one of the flaws in the system at that time. Now, you mentioned the Honolulu event in 1989, which also involved a cargo door, this time on a 747 that was flying passengers. And unlike this event, where the cargo door on the DC-9 sort of went over the top of the fuselage, as you were describing to me before the show, this cargo door came open, slammed against the fuselage above the cargo door area, and both the cargo door and a piece of the fuselage siding came off the airplane entirely, damaged a couple of engines. But uh, you had aerodynamic effects, obviously, and obviously two engines were out. But this was a different dynamic than what happened with the DC-9 near Fort Worth. And in the case of the Honolulu event, the crew was able to turn the aircraft around and land it. There were, I believe, nine uh, passengers who were killed in that event. And That's there are other cargo doors events that have happened previous to this. Uh, probably the most famous is the uh, THY Airlines uh, seven, excuse me, DC ten event in Paris. I believe that was in 1974, where there was a separation of the cargo door and uh, disruption of some of the control cables. Uh, between the passenger uh, floor and the cargo area. Not the same dynamic of what happened here, but cargo doors not closing correctly. That's happened several times. And this was a different set of sequence of events than what happened in the events, events I just mentioned. Right. You know, originally in the, in the 60s and in, in early 70s, these airplanes had what we call plug doors. And the door was bigger than the hole in the airplane. So when the pressurization came on, it squeezed it and it couldn't push it out. So it plugged the hole, hence the name, the nickname, plug doors. And it, it would, the door would stay contained. But there was all sorts of problems with baggage and freight with those kinds of doors. And when they started to increase the belly freight and what you were carrying in the belly, the airplanes got bigger, they went to the non-plug doors, which swung out. And that's the comment today. The, the airplanes, almost all of them today, have, have doors to swing out. And there are a couple of reasons. I mean, I can remember working when an airplane would come in and the ramp or the baggage handlers uh, couldn't open the door because in flight turbulence, the bags fell against the door. You couldn't push it in. And that, that led to a, a lot of delays and a lot of problems. And just so, to make it clear visually, a plug type door let's say this is the fuselage, the door actually rotates inside the aircraft like this, as opposed to the door in this DC-9, which rotated outside of the fuselage. That's correct. That's correct. So if the baggage or freight falls on top of the door, you can't push it in. And that was fairly common. I mean, just myself working the gates, I, I can remember maybe two or three a year. I, I mean, we've had a lot. Uh, a lot of those problems and until they went to the non-plug door then that problem went away but other problems went and and not properly latching the door was another one that i've seen far too many times you know the ramp guys would would close the door they think it was closed the airplanes would taxi out and they'd come back in with a door light and we'd go out and sometimes it was debris in the tracks of the door sometimes just opening and closing it would put the light out it just you know, for whatever reason, it didn't uh, uh, register. You know, the so switches, uh, you know, the mechanical switches were a problem. They replaced all those with proximity switches, which were much, much more reliable. So there, there was a lot of work uh, at the engineering level to try to eliminate a lot of these latching indication problems. And, but we still had the, the uh, problems uh, like like the one in Hawaii, like this one, where human error came into, into the picture. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about Evergreen Airlines as an overall airline. Uh, this uh, particular accident was a Part 121 operation, 
which is typically the kind of operation we'd see domestically in the U.S. for passenger operations. But you can have a Part 121 operation for cargo as well. And unlike an airline, let's say like UPS or FedEx, which is all cargo, Evergreen actually had some primarily passenger aircraft as well as uh, exclusively and primarily cargo aircraft. Is that correct? Yeah. Or was that uh, during your time there as well? No. While I was there, we had a number of uh, DC-8s and, uh, and I think three uh, 747s. Don't hold me to the numbers, but we had 747s and we had a bunch of uh, stretch DC-8s and those were flying all over the world. And many of those DC-8s were combination airplanes where you would, where the seats were on pallets, just like freight. And you would just roll the seats out of the airplane and store them on, on dollies, just like cargo dollies, and store them at the airport. And the airplane would fill up with freight and it'd go away someplace. And then it would come back and you put the seats back in the airplane. So it was a, a what they call quick change convertible airplane for freight and for the passengers. So... That business in the 80s was really, actually, in the, it started in the late 70s, but really caught fire in the 80s, where everybody was jumping into the into the overnight cargo business with two feet, because there was a lot of money to be made uh, in that business. So, And a company like Evergreen was flying for other people. So the DC-9s that I worked on were flying primarily for uh, Emory Air Freight, at least Monday through Friday. On Saturday morning, the flight, the the the, uh, the last freight run for Emory would come in, and it didn't leave until Monday night. Well, most of the time we didn't leave that airplane sitting around the weekend. That airplane went off and and carried cargo for somebody else. Uh, and sometimes they went well quite away. South Africa was one of the trips that that uh, that I participated in which is a long flight in the DC-9. Uh, but that, that was a busy time for, for uh, freight at that time. That gets into the whole question of, the DC-9s do ETOPS, or was this like a special uh, um, routing that they did for flying from the U.S. to South Africa? Uh, I don't, it wasn't a regular run. I think they did one or two runs, but it was really a circuitous work, route. You flew out of Boston and you went up to, uh, Iceland, uh, got fuel, and then flew over to, to uh, I, usually Ireland, and fueled up again, and then went to uh, northern Africa and fueled up again, and then came down. If I remember right, we came down like 50 miles off the west coast of Africa because you didn't want to fly over Africa. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of wars in Africa. In fact, I, I uh, flew to, to, to Nambia for Trans International Airlines on one trip. And the next week, the airplane, that very same airplane, was shot down over Nambia by uh, rebels using a surface to air missile, a handheld man pad. So it was uh, hazardous to fly over the land. So everybody was flying offshore. And yeah, the was air traffic control was weak there. And I mean, it was. It was uh, really the wild west of flying. Now, that wasn't the only semi-wild thing you did on Evergreen Airlines. Uh, you were telling me earlier about uh, some of the aircraft were equipped with JATO bottles, jet-assisted takeoff bottles, which is basically a small rocket that helps the air airplane take off. But you, tell, you told the story better than I could, so why don't you take it over from here? All right, so the original 931 that I worked on in 930, and it might have been 932 as well, I don't remember clearly. But we had a few airplanes that had JATO bottles, which were tiny rockets, solid fuel rockets. They were mounted two on each side of the airplane behind the wheel well. And uh, if you had a shot field takeoff or the airplane was heavy, really heavy, with fuel and cargo, uh, JATO would help you get uh, going, get you off the ground. It would, the airplane really accelerated. In fact, I was on one airplane those things were time controlled, so you only had them on the airplane, and I forget how long, uh, like a year or two years or something like that. And uh, then they had to be replaced, even if they weren't used. And of course, nobody wanted to change them when they were when you were bringing them in. They would, you know, wire it up 
you you wanted to discharge those before you started messing with them. So you the pilots would would uh, take off using the JADO to use them up so that they could take them into a maintenance facility and have them replaced. And I got the opportunity uh, one time to ride with them to do that. And uh, let me tell you, that was a real eye opener when the, when they ignited those four bottles. It made it a different airplane. So what civilian Fortunately, airport would allow you to take off with, with JATO bottles screaming out the back end? They were very noisy, but the acceleration on the airplane was was tremendous. Getting back to the accident, this was a cargo event. Both crew, unfortunately, were, were killed in this. No one on the ground was injured or killed. Uh, what was the effect or change that happened in the system because of what was learned from this? Uh, obviously, this was a, a cargo aircraft, so it didn't really affect uh, what most uh, civilian uh, passenger aircraft were doing. But was there anything that came out of this that changed how the industry operated with, with respect to cargo and cargo door aircraft? Uh, well, there were some recommendations from the NTSB on this, and and interestingly, the NTSB did an investigation on this accident. It was a military charter, so oftentimes they choose not to do the investigation for military charters, uh, even if it's a 121 carrier. So it, they could have come in on the 121 side. They chose to come in on this airplane, I think. No one ever told me this, but I think because there are so many DC-9s operating. And at the time of the crash, no one knew what the circumstances were. And since there were so many of them operating uh, in the cargo business, uh, there was a need to find out what was going on. In the late 1980s, a DC-9 or variations of the MD-80 were still in production. They were still quite popular around the world and around the US, so there were quite a few in operation. Fast forward to 2023, um, the 717, the Boeing 717, was the uh, last uh, variant of the DC-9 that was manufactured. And that's been out of production for quite some time. And I can't think of any airline in the U.S. that still operates those in a, in a passenger configuration. I think Delta may. I don't know if they've Delta packed all their, their 717s yet or not. You occasionally still see a DC-9 running around, but I haven't paid much attention to who's operating it. But they're out there, and out of the out of the U.S., there's a bunch of them. They made thousands of them, three or four thousand DC nines. So they're they're still around. Like I said, the last MD ninety uh, was produced in the nineties. So, I mean, that's only twenty five years ago. So, there's probably still some of them running around the world. Now, for this uh, event. And again, it has a, an accident report, which will be a part of this, this show that will be on the show notes. There isn't any um, a public docket to this. And there wasn't a whole lot of um, media coverage of this back in 1989. So there's scant amount of evidence or scant amount of information about this. But uh, if anything, uh, there, like with any event, there are lessons learned from this. One of this being uh, when it comes to... Uh, an airplane that has had modification, where the modification may not be standard across the fleet. If you're uh, involved in this, whether as a uh, as a uh, maintenance person, as a as a ground handler, or as a as a crew member, it's important to realize that if you have an unusual situation, an unusual configuration, then uh, make sure you understand how things work with that. And again, if you fly it long enough, you'll come across all sorts of uh, let's say unique combinations of add-ons to aircraft. But it doesn't matter if it's a one-time thing or if it's the entire fleet that has it. Whatever's on that aircraft, you have to understand how it works. And if you don't, ask some questions. You know, this is basically my next to last word on this one because, uh, because there hasn't been many of these uh, model aircraft and cargo out there. There's not much I can say about, you know, if you're in this fleet, do this or do that. But I can say that if you're on an aircraft or involved with an aircraft, as an unusual configuration, take a little bit more time to understand it. Yeah, it's it's really difficult for, for pilots to understand this. It's difficult for mechanics to understand it sometimes. The, you know, so if you're, you're a pilot, you show up in an airplane, multiple manufacturers doing the, these door conversions on these airplanes. So you pull up to a DC-9, which you checked out in, but it's got a door that you're not familiar with. And that, that comes the problem. And of course, 
both airline people and military people, cargo people, they don't have a clue uh, what's going on. They may get told how to close the door and uh, that's it. But the reason why the first officer is closing the door because they didn't trust that to the cargo people or to the military people. I mean, the military people, there's a lot of strange airplanes that they get to see. Uh, so, I mean, we even have Russian airplanes calling cargo in the United States for the military. So it's it's uh, it's a whole interesting ball of wax. And the FAA, in my opinion, was a little bit uh, generous with the uh, the engineering data that they allowed these people to get away with the airplanes. And uh, so engineers said it was okay, uh, but reliability wasn't there. I can tell you that we constantly fought door indication problems, constantly on these airplanes. A little bit of wear, the switches would, would start to blink and, you know, almost make contact. It was just, just an endless problems with some of these door installations and the floors too. I mean, there was a whole bunch of airplanes that were converted in Israel, mainly 727s, that, and FedEx had, had quite a few of them, and they ended up having to be scrapped because the floor was structurally sound enough to haul all the freight that they were. They were having all kinds of structural problems with the airplane until finally the FAA engineering department said, you know what, that floor is not strong enough and we have broken the airplanes. So they pulled the, they pulled the type certificate from those airplanes. They all went to the, to the graveyard. So there was a, there was a big rush. I, I, you know, I've said that I'm like a broken record here. But there was a big rush at that period of time to get your hands on any and every 727 DC-9 to convert them into cargo. That was the business. And then in the, in the middle 80s, it was all the DC-8s that United and uh, Delta were retiring to grab those to do this conversion on those uh, into cargo. And now we see it with the, we saw it recently with the Airbus A300 we're seeing it right now with some uh, 737s, a bunch of 737s being converted to cargo. And of course the 747 uh, uh, was originally made with a cargo version, but now there's been outside people doing cargo door installations on 747s in a number of places. Now they're doing 767s. That's the, that's the most popular cargo airplane of all. And FedEx and UPS are buying brand new 777s from the factory in cargo configuration. So it's still all crazy mix of airplanes and a lot of conversions and a lot of uh, brand new manufacturing with uh, with what was passing the airplanes converted to cargo. So okay. that's trying to satisfy all the consumer demand for these products that were being made all over the world. You know, the, the number of flights from China to the US with consumer goods on them, is, if you counted them, uh, I've never counted them, but I've been in Alaska when they've landed because it's like a, a window of time. It's like a hub right there. And you see 30 airplanes coming in, all 747s coming in from the Far East today, heading both ways. Airplanes have become the boats of, of 100 years ago, carrying all kinds of freight. So for those who are flying in these... Uh boasts of the 21st century who are well less than 100 years old, what words of wisdom can you give them as the last word on this show? Well, and this is clearly the pre-flight was done. So, you know, this falls right into my preaching that I do about doing an adequate pre-flight. But it really is to understand your airplane. In this case, the pre-flight they did, the pre-planning was probably all okay. But the last step of closing the airplane up was obviously taking a little too lightly by the first officer and the captain. And they relied upon lights to indicate that it was down. I mean, did the first officer fully pay attention to the closing? Because I know that I could tell if a door wasn't closed properly by just listening to it and watching the door as, it, as the latch is strained to pull it in. So sometimes you didn't need the lights, but you know, you need to understand that. And obviously, this first officer didn't fully understand uh, the, this airplane. 
Maybe it was the first time he flew this particular one. We don't know because I know they had more than one DC-9. So there's a lot of variables in there that they don't even talk about in the accident report. All they say is that the first officer uh, didn't didn't close the door properly because he took didn't take enough time for the hydraulics to latch it down. So uh, that could be correct. But it's one of those things that we'll really never be 100% sure of. So, but in my final word, I'll go back to what I always say. Free plan, free plan, free plan, free flight, free flight, free flight. <laughs> I mean, get out there and take a good look at your airplane. Make sure it's closed up. On the years I worked for, for an FBO, I can't tell you how many airplanes I saw come in with fuel caps missing. And some after he left that place. Occasionally, the guy who owned the, the FBO that I worked for was death on anybody missing a fuel cap. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just that was that was one of his things. If you sent an airplane out with with a fuel cap missing, uh, you, you were going to you were going to get a good talking to at the very least. So, anyway, a good pre flight, a good pre planning, and after you get in the air, put your head on the swivel because we're still seeing more and more student pilots with instructors on board having incidents and accidents and we're going to talk about those in the coming coming uh, podcast and with that please fly safely thank you for checking out our show we really value our listeners and subscribers our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it so please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.